Generally speaking, I don't really care where I go to get gas or to exchange currency or where my oranges and bananas come from. It's rare you see someone at the grocery store checking for which groves the fruit are from because there really isn't that much of a difference. These are what we would call identical products or homogeneous products. Different producers produce essentially identical versions of the same product. But I care a lot about which brand of smartphone I get, or what clothes I wear, or where we go for pizza, or what movie we watch. These are differentiated products, or heterogeneous products. Different producers are making the same kind of thing, but each of them does it a little differently. Sometimes no one can copy them exactly because they have patents and other protections, as is the case with smartphones and movies. Other times, it's because people prefer the variety, as is the case with pizza restaurants and clothing. Whatever the case, firms with differentiated products have a little monopoly. It isn't a true monopoly because their customers have plenty of alternatives to choose from, meaning these firms still face competition. But their differences afford them a little bit of market power. Tastes are an obvious source of product differentiation. People have different tastes, and each of us like things a certain way. We can discuss whether Pepsi or Coke is better, or which fast food place has the best french fries, or which movie was the best of the year. Our different preferences mean that these firms have a little market power. If Coca-Cola raises their price by five cents, they won't lose all of their customers to Pepsi because many people prefer Coke enough that they'll stick with them. That isn't true for gas stations, which could raise their price by five cents and lose all of their customers to the station across the street. Product differentiation grants a little market power. Another source of product differentiation is style. Fashion is an easy example, where the products all serve the same purpose, but all look different. Certainly, there are some genuine differences in function or comfort, but what really draws people to one producer or another is their style. Car companies also try to differentiate on style and attract customers who want to match or embody that style. Style is a bit different from taste, however. Taste is really about all five senses. It's about our preference for how things taste or smell or sound or feel or look. Style is more of a network good. Style is about how we present ourselves to the world, and the value of a particular style to us will depend on who else wears that style. Humans are very concerned about status, and higher prices won't fully deter them away from the style they want. The last source of product differentiation we'll talk about is brand. This is related to tastes and style as well. Apple does a great job with branding, not only offering features customers prefer or a style they want to adopt, but also a trust in the quality of their product. That is what I mean by brand here. It's the reputation of a firm which attracts customers to their products over rivals. Banking is an industry built on trust, and so banks try to build their brand to associate it in the customer's mind with trust. If you've ever switched banks, it probably wasn't due to taste or style, but due to some policy or surprise fee that you felt violated your trust and hurt your old bank's brand. Similar reasons can apply to consumer appliances and whether or not you feel Samsung, Whirlpool, or LG are the most reliable brands. And which parcel service you might choose also depends a little on their perceived reliability. And if you're thinking, well, usually the thing that matters to me is the price, then you really are starting to think like an economist. Branding doesn't override price differences but it might lead some people to tolerate a small price increase because of their feelings about the brand. And that means these firms have a little market power. Differentiated products allows for a fourth type of market structure. We've looked at monopolies and oligopolies where there are a small number of firms and the lack of competition gives them market power. 
but you can also have a market which has a large number of firms selling similar but not identical products. In fact, this is probably the most common type of market structure, where firms each do something different, but there's still a lot of competition. Next, we'll look and see how this market structure works.